And today, we're sort of in a little in-between spot, and I would say about 80% of what I'm going to do today you will feel like is review, and that's probably a good way to feel. So if it seems like the things I'm discussing with you are a little bit of old news, then that's good. That means you're remembering it. Good move. That's great. George. I don't... I may, I can't remember, I, ha I gave three tests Friday. I've got one set graded, one set half graded, one set not graded. And I can't remember which one I'm, I don't think yours is done yet. It could be. Check back later in the day, I'll probably have it for you. Anyway, uh, the person that we're talking about, however, is uh, quite important, but I don't want to do much with him. His name is Husserl. But if you do go off and do further philosophical studies, then it's highly probable that you will come back and run into him. And so I want to at least put him in a context. And I'm going to do that and really leave it at that. To try to dive into him more deeply would take more time and would involve more frustration on the part of you and me than I'm willing to invest in it. He is quite complicated difficult to understand, important, but I think more important for his effects than for getting inside the mechanics of what his actual thought was. So I'm going to do it that way. This is highly inadequate, but nevertheless, it may be of some help to you. Husserl is associated with a philosophical school of thought called phenomenology. Phenomenology, something like that. Phenomenology. There's many O's in there. There ain't just there's an E in there. Okay, yeah. phenomen. Is that here? Phenomenology. That looks better. But to get some idea of phenomenology. Phenomenology, we need to go back to Kant, so let me just remute, remind you of a couple of things about him. Um, Kant, you recall, wants to rescue knowledge. He believes that knowledge has been basically undermined, sabotaged, and the very possibility of knowledge has been largely destroyed through the philosophy of... Who's the guy that Kant thinks has just more or less ravaged Western epistemology, that philosopher's name is? Ben? It is. I thought your hand would be in the air. I thought you needed me to answer because I Oh, because you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is so quick. I mean, this guy. <laughs> that is, that's remarkably quick. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it is. So it's a Hume, so you've got that. Remember, British empiricism taken to its extreme basically leaves us in a place where knowledge is, is not, really not even possible and anything we think we know is highly doubtful. And so Kant sees that as a big problem. Of course, he wants to rescue us from the bad effects that, he's, that he sees in Hume. And uh, he does that, oddly enough, by making this distinction, as we've talked about before, between the noumenal and the phenomenal. I don't know how in the world Kant thought that was a rescue of knowledge. It seems to me that that just makes the problem worse, you know. But anyway, that's what Kant does, and that gave us what we've talked about in some depth. Now, Kant's wall. All right, so that is all review. You're familiar with all of that. Kant puts upstairs three things, and those three things are, Kayla? God, self, and things. Thank you. And Kant says that we cannot know those directly. We cannot be sure of them. They are, in a sense, banished to this upper story. But we need to, as you know, kind of assume that they're there, that that's the place that faith operates. And so what uh, Kant really produces in terms of certainty 
is not much. He gives us a kind of skepticism, but he does leave us with phenomena. All right. And so the phenomena is what we can have some certainty of, but we can't be sure what's causing the phenomena. We can't be sure that there's anything out there actually producing or causing my experience. But I need to assume it, otherwise it means I'm crazy, I'm nuts. You know, and I don't want to be insane, so I assume it is a numinal just to protect the sense of sanity. All right. All right, now, having said that, how can I do this? Kant produces two kinds of skepticism. Because Scott, uh, Kant himself is a bit of a skeptic. He's a skeptic about what's up here. Do you like that? Scott, Scott yeah, yeah. Two kinds of skepticism. One says, we cannot know the numinal order. So let's just not worry about it. Let's just concern ourselves with the phenomenal level and leave the rest to faith. All right. We can't know it's there. Let's not worry about proving that it's there. Let's simply operate on the basis of faith that it's there. Kant himself would be an example of that. A more dramatic example of that would be Kierkegaard. And I don't want to say much more about Kierkegaard because Josiah is going to illumine us on that subject. And the later thinker who would be in the same line would be Bart. And in some distant, doubtful sense, maybe Boltline. So you get this. We have, we have Kant gives us skepticism about the numinal. How do I deal with my lack of certainty? Well, one thing I can do is simply operate on the basis of faith that it's out there. But don't confuse the issues by trying to prove those great truths. So Kierkegaard, for example, is hostile to what you are calling Christian apologetics, especially evidential apologetics. Anything that is an attempt to build on the foundation of evidence, convictions of the truth of what is noumenal, Kierkegaard sees as doubtful, it's compromising to this world's wisdom, basically is a waste of time from the point of view of you know, Christian thought. Not so much presuppositional apologetics, because that is faith. That is, in fact, starting your apologetics based on faith, you see. And so in some ways you would say the rise of presuppositional apologetics has been in some ways driven by Kant's wall. Thomas Aquinas thinks you can start here and get there by reason. You know, Kant doesn't think so and a lot of apologetics since Kant has agreed and in some ways presuppositional apologetics operates on that assumption but it does say we can get there by faith. So Kierkegaard, Bart, in some sense I'm somewhat cautious about this Boltmann and so on. So that's one approach. The other kind of skepticism says we cannot know the phenomenal, or I'm sorry, we cannot know the noumenal because it is not there. So one side says it's there, we can only know it by faith. The other side says we can't know it because it's not there at all. this doubt, although it's stronger than that, but it kind of goes nicely with faith, you know. So we have faith up here, doubt down here. And maybe the first name that pops on the list here, kind of the corollary to Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard says we take the new middle by faith, aside 
that would say there is no noumenal, there is only doubt, and uh, so we shouldn't try to embrace it at all by faith. We should build everything based on what we know at the phenomenal level. The first name that would pop up on that list, the person we've already looked at, would be who? Matthew? Is that Descartes? Yeah, going back too far. No, more recent. Uh, Is that Nietzsche? Sure, Nietzsche. Right. And Nietzsche then produces later thinkers, notably Sartre, in the 20th century and a variety of others. Yeah. Now, when we were talking about Kant, we said that out of Kant, we have these kind of two um, uh, approaches that came out. I'm going to do a little separate uh, line here just to keep you really confused. And so we've got the optimists over here, Hegel, and a bunch of others that would come after Hegel. And these are those who are trying, in some sense, to rediscover metaphysics. They're trying to rediscover what it seems Kant has lost to us. So they're trying to do it. But they're not doing it, notice, by leaping up here by faith. They're doing it rather by trying to bring the noumenal down into the phenomenal. So we've spent some time dealing with that. That should you know, feel like review. The other class, we've said, were the pessimists. It's here now that I need to break out some subparts. All right. So we've talked in general terms about these pessimistic philosophers. One class of them would be pure materialists. Pessimistic philosophers. All right, so the most famous uh, materialist that we've talked about so far, you know, the pessimistic side, coming up Kant, and his name would be anybody. Most famous materialist, pure materialist, wants to build his whole philosophy around materialism, and his name is You Are What You Eat, Mister. You Are What You Eat, and his name is Sydney. No, mystified. Yes. Feuerbach, sure. So here we have the pure materials. <clears throat> and so far, that's about as much as we've talked about. We've talked about others, uh, but generally kind of lump them together in this materialistic you know, class, and so now I want to break these out a little bit more because this is what we need to sort of introduce ourselves to the 20th century. And so the other side, there's these materialists, and, and Feuerbach would, for example, be uh, someone that you would call a kind of um, materialistic scientist. He believes that by science we can discover all that there is. Comte would be another example. We only explain material phenomena by virtue of material phenomena. Pure materialists. Matter is all there is. Philosophy can do no better than try to understand it, but don't try to get beyond it. All right, so that, I think you have some sense of that. Then you've got, so on the other side, so if this is a materialistic scientist, we're going to have over here a group that would be called materialistic <clears throat> spiritualists. Now that may seem strange. I hope it does. What's a little odd about the expression, a materialistic spiritualist? That's right, so it seems a little bit oxymoronic. Does it not, Nicole? Yes, and you're all wondering, how can this be, Mr. Thor? That there would be a materialistic spiritualist. All right, 
What I mean by this is really the rise in the late 19th century of a whole way of thinking that came under the broad heading, New Thought. And much of this was religious in character. So there was a bunch of religions that popped up in the late 19th century that had an odd sort of marriage of a kind of materialism with a sort of spiritualism. The most famous, the one you're most familiar with, if you're familiar with any of them, would be a Christian movement called Christian Science. All right, Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy. The only one of several examples. I want you to kind of know these, but that's the one you would be the most familiar with. So what did Mary Baker Eddy teach? Well, she taught, you know, of course, her whole deal was to be healthy, to be you know, science and health with key to the scriptures was the most famous book she wrote, to my knowledge, the only book she wrote. And if you want to ever feel like you're just wading through molasses, then you should read that book. You know? <laughs> uh, it is stultifying to the brain. I really think that's the reason why people have the healing effect of reading that book, is because they just want to, they, they, the, the reading the book is so painful that it makes anything else you're suffering from seem less painful, you know, I don't know, it's, I, I don't know, all due respects to the Christian scientists in the room, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, it is really an amazing, uh, you just flip, flip the book and, the, flip the book, and, this is a bad day, I'm not getting there, you know, flip the book open to any random place and uh, anything you read is just going to have that, that kind of uh, strange effect on you. But anyway, how does it work? How does Christian science work? Well, Mary Baker already believed that Jesus healed people and he did it in a way that seemed supernatural to the people who originally observed it. She believes Jesus performed miracles. But she doesn't believe, if I can put it this way, that his miracles were, were miraculous. Okay. She simply thinks Jesus was ahead of his time. That Jesus figured out, as some kind of ancient genius, how to tap in to the forces of creation and apply them to the problems of human misery. So... If you can imagine, you're living in a universe and there are unseen forces that are all around you, like the wind. You don't see it, but it's always there. It's always affecting you, a power. And if you have the proper skills, you can harness that power. That's the science. That's why she called it Christian science. Because she believed that just as you can go down to the river and using science harness the power of the river, you can, using a kind of science, harness the power of these unseen forces. The forces are not in themselves necessarily personal. It's not like God in the sense that we think of God. It's almost like the force in Star Wars. It's just kind of there to be manipulated. And if you will develop the skills, you can manipulate those powers and produce effects. And the most important effect you can produce by using those powers is the effect of healing. So if you, you know, fall down and hurt yourself, have a headache or whatever, you can harness these. And that was one example that I want you to understand. It was one of many movements that hit the surface in the late 19th century that had that kind of sort of assumption line behind it. Now do you see, it's something like, it's, it's still in a sense uh, pessimistic, in the sense that it's not leaping up here to some sort of ultimate transcendent God, it still forces down here at the phenomenal level, but in a sense they're spiritual forces. But they're not spiritual in the sense we think of it, it's like they're simply forces that are unseen. <laughs> Other examples. <coughs> There was, uh, these are all part of the so-called New Thought Movement. Uh, unity. 
Some of you know that over on 29th, there's a church called uh, the Unity Church of Truth. You ever seen that? The Unity, you go there. Good. The <laughs> Unity Church of Truth. And how, how many have seen that? Okay, it's a nice building, flowers outside, you know. It is a church that started at the same time. In fact, the founders of the Unity Church of Truth, it was a married couple, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. They, <laughs> they knew of and had some hostility toward Mary Baker Eddy. They were both teaching basically the same thing, and they were in competition with each other. Mary Baker Eddy didn't like them, they didn't like her. But they were all trying to get their share of the market of essentially a kind of superstitious attitude at the time that you can harness the forces of nature to produce what appear to be miraculous effects. Uh, there was a movement called Theosophy. and a variety of others. All I want you to recognize, these are not great thinkers. They don't make it to our short list of great thinkers. Mary Baker Eddy was no great thinker. But they kind of caught a wave. You, you see what happens in popular culture. If you begin having people talk in these ways, the human heart still wants to believe in something transcendent. But if you're, if you're taught basically there's nothing upstairs, then you seek transcendence somewhere else. And in this case, they were kind of seeking it in this sort of strange spiritualism. And so Christian science and these other movements really had that, that sort of thing going on. All right. Then there's a third movement that represented a little bit of a compromise between them. All right. A hybrid which borrowed the materialism of people like Feuerbach, a kind of materialistic science, and a materialistic spirit, if you will, from the other side, combine them and produce what's called phenomenology. And Husserl is the first guy on the scene here. But the term you want to know is phenomenology. The reason the term phenomenology is used is because it goes back to Kant, who said there is the phenomenal level, and this is an attempt to build a philosophy out of pure phenomena. <coughs> no noumena, nothing upstairs, but trying to build some kind of philosophical outlook based on the phenomena, but trying to escape pure materialism, which seemed to be deficient. Trying to have some place for spirit while still operating largely at a phenomenal level. Kayla reported the other day on William James. And you may recall that while he sounds fundamentally like a materialist, he still has this little spirit aspect. Do you remember that? And that's the same thing. He would be part of that. Same movement, attempt to try to pull them together, find a place for spirit in a world where you would think fundamentally there is no spirit. Trying to work in this strange kind of place for the unseen, and it gives rise to, in many cases, a, a, a somewhat superstitious outlook, although Husserl and William James and others are not exactly superstitious. These people are. These people are trying to make it more sophisticated, and it becomes this, uh, this third movement. So, trying to synthesize the two, And it produced then phenomenology. So let me give you a few little bullets about phenomenology. <clears throat> but before I give you any bullets, I just want you to realize that phenomenology is largely responsible for producing at a later level or later time uh, existentialism. And so you could say that, uh, in some ways, existentialism, especially the atheistic brand, is flowing out of, of the effects of Husserl. Husserl, I'm not as interested in, in terms of the details of his thought, but the connections that he makes between prior movements and what comes after is really the reason he's important.
No, oh, okay. I saw your hand moving. All right, so a couple of things about Husserl. <coughs> Husserl wants to apply the scientific method to the idea of consciousness. Scientific method applied to the category of consciousness. Is that him or is that? This is Husserl. Uh, both. Husserl is the really founder of the philosophy called phenomenology. And the first thing that I want you to know about it is he's trying to be a scientist. Okay. But he's trying to put the idea of consciousness under his microscope. Does that answer your question, Avery? He wants to understand thought, which is what he thinks consciousness is, but he wants to understand it more or less in biological terms. He wants to be a materialist. The problem with pure materialism is that ultimately it, 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 there's no place for consciousness in it. I mean, you think about it this way. You, under a materialistic paradigm are simply a material object. No different from a typewriter. Do y'all know what a typewriter is? <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of an antique. You know. When I went to school, I thought it was pretty high tech to have an electric typewriter. <laughs> and when I went to college, I was really excited because I had a typewriter that would correct mistakes. Now you had to backspace over them to do that. I mean, you know, it wasn't like it was thinking. That was pretty exciting. But what I want you to get out of my little uh, uh, sort of digression here is that if you live in a purely materialistic universe, there's really not much place for the idea of consciousness in a typewriter, is there? And there is no more place for consciousness in you than there is in a typewriter. You see, in a purely materialistic universe, the idea of consciousness doesn't make much sense. Now, Feuerbach tried to escape that. These people try to escape it. But if you just look at it in cold, analytical terms, you realize Consciousness is something other than what you materialists are trying to make it, just sort of a chemical reaction happening in your brain. It's got to be something more than that. Well, you go over to Christian science, you see, Mary Baker Eddy is Neoplatonic. If you're a Neoplatonist, the fundamental reality is the one, and everything else is kind of emanating away from that, right? Remember that, Neoplatonism? She's a Neoplatonist, and the further you get from pure spirit, the closer you get to what? What's kind of down the ladder here, Nicole? Well, evil, yes, that's good. And evil is associated with, and we'll put that here, that's a good answer. Evil is associated with what, Ben? It's associated with non-being. Non-being, if we go all the way down far enough, but just before we get to non-being, we are at the level of, Krista? Matter. Matter. <laughs> Remember that? In, in Plotinus' thought, you had the one, then you had angels, and you had, what, humans, and so on, and you get down here to pure matter, rocks, yeah, and then finally nothing. And so, the further you get from pure reality, the closer you get to a pure matter, pure materialism. And for Mary Baker Eddy, evil is associated with non-being, and matter is right next to it, 
And so there's a sense in which evil is not real. And that's what you'll use it here about Christian science. They don't believe that evil is real. And in some sense, that's true. They believe that it's so far from pure spirit that it really lacks reality and that the true scientist learns to incorporate the deeper reality of pure spirit. You know, and that's, so that's very big already. All right, so you've got a pure materialist who says there is no spirit, there's only matter. That leaves us without a place for consciousness. You have a sort of pure spiritualist, a materialistic spiritualist, who has a place for, for um, you know, mind and so on, but, but finally leaves us without any, any good explanation for our physical, biological existence. That's where she has a problem. So people like Husserl are trying to find the balance, and so they give us a sort of analysis of consciousness using scientific biology, but still trying to have that kind of spirit flavor in there somehow. So the, my first point then is we're applying a scientific analysis to the, to the experience of consciousness. That even goes back to Kant, because remember his transcendental apperception of the ego is his notion of consciousness. Well, it's like Husserl's putting his microscope right on that trying to understand it. He understands it in terms of what he calls intentionality. Husserl understands that there are material <laughs> things in my world and that I relate to them by what he calls intentionality. Now intentionality for him is a very broad term and it simply means that sense in which I frame a thought of these things in my mind. I have some relationship to them. I have a marker in my hand and I have some connection to it in my mind and anything that is the connection he calls intentionality. That's when he really tries to put the, um, he tries to close in on that in an incredibly complicated way. This is where I'm just not going to burden either you or me with trying to explain it. But I guess all I'll try to do is, is give you a feel for it. There is this kind of razor edge of our awareness of our existence at this moment, that kind of sense of that moment time is passing and you have in this complicated thing you call the present a whole bunch of things that are all sort of tugging on you and you are connected to them you're connected to the table where you're sitting you have some connection to me up here sort of distracting you right now you have some connection to the notes that you're taking you have some connection to the chair upon which you're sitting and all of these things are all uh, affecting you right now in the present tense. This is your consciousness, you see. And he wants to take that razor edge of your present consciousness and sort of dissect it. What is it? And he does so coming up with all kinds of sophisticated jargon uh, that are really beyond the scope of what I want to talk about. But, it, but that's the heart of it. And he's trying to, therefore, pay his dues to both sides. He wants to pay his dues to the materialists, who really do take seriously a, a sort of materialistic universe, but that there's still something else, some kind of non-spiritual aspect to us. But it's not spirit in the Christian sense. It's just sort of a non-material notion of mind that is your present awareness of yourself as a human being. And that, of course, he, go, he goes way off into a number of things. He goes into language and how we use language and how we sort of relate to things by way of language. And that gives rise to linguistic analysis, a whole school of thought that's also been important. But it also gives rise to existentialism, which is focused on existence. You know, your <coughs> existence is always in the present tense. You don't exist yesterday, do you? you know, 
You are not existing tomorrow. You're only existing when? When do you exist, Megan? Right now. This is the only time. And the time that you just said right now doesn't exist anymore, does it? Because it's only now. But that's gone too, isn't it? But then there's that, but that's gone. It's gone. And we're just on this razor edge going on. And you're never quite there. Because every given moment as you try to grasp it, it's gone. And you've got a new one, and it's gone. And, and there's that just being on this wave, this present moment of your consciousness. What is that? What is that? You see. And he goes into a highly elaborate attempt to develop the sense of phenomena. The phenomenology means this understanding of what it is to be existing in the present moment with a material universe around you and yet something in you that is in some sense or other spirit. And he gives us then this, this, um, this whole movement in the 20th century of existentialism which really takes that in a little bit different direction. So, I don't know, I, I feel like this is kind of a chaotic descript description, but uh, it's, uh, I hope you get at least a flavor for it. It all still connects to some of the broader things we've talked about. Phenomenology is certainly continues to be a, an important um, <clears throat> aspect of 20th century and even 21st century philosophy. Our beloved uh, <clears throat> Michael Collender, you know, got his PhD. Uh, and his whole PhD was devoted to one aspect of Husserl's philosophy. You know? So, so that, that's where he spent all of his time, was reading just one aspect, one implication of Husserl's phenomenology. Um, but, uh, you know, that's so far beyond the scope of our immediate interest. I, uh, I'm not going to try to talk with you about what he did or what his interest was at that, but just so you know that it's not a dead letter yet, that you know, that particular approach is still out there. And, so, comments about that? I, you know, does that uh, if you can just kind of put Husserl in a place in your outline and hang on to that, it may be of help to you at some later point, especially if you do philosophical studies. We will refer back to him when we talk about Sartre, uh, but that won't be for a while. Just like in some research I've been doing, I've come across how in between Sartre and Husserl was. Heidegger? Yeah. Where would he fit in? Okay, Heidegger. We will talk about Heidegger. Because <clears throat> um, he would be... Yeah, he he Heidegger could, you could put him here for sure. Yeah. Martin Heidegger will do that. Heidegger is a very important uh, source behind Sartre. Uh, up here, I would say you could put Heidegger right here because he's also an important source behind Heidegger behind Beaumont. And don't try to make too much sense out of this diagram. I realize it's a little nonsensical, but uh, if you just kind of get the, the sort of the, uh, the, the chaos of the lay of the land there, you'll, you'll be in good shape. But yeah, that's good, and, and we will talk about Heidegger um, sometime in the next uh, two or three weeks after we get back. He is important.